Professor Louis Shelley is the Omer L. and Nancy Hurst Professor at George Mason University. She founded and directs the Terrorism, Transnational Crime, and Corruption Center. Her most recent books include Dirty Entanglements, Corruption, Crime, and Terrorism, and Human Trafficking, A Global Perspective. Her latest book, Dark Commerce, How a New Illicit Economy is Threatening Our Future, was written while she served as the inaugural Andrew Carnegie Fellow. Louise has received fellowships and grants from the Guggenheim Foundation, the Fulbright Program, the Rockefeller Foundation, the National Science Foundation, and other institutions that support her research. She served for six years as the World Economic Forum's Global Agenda Councils. She is a life member of the Council on Foreign Relations and of the Global Initiative Against Transnational Organized Crime. Louise received her PhD in sociology from the University of Pennsylvania. Professor Shelley, welcome. Thank you. Happy to be here. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, and welcome to Baker Institute, of course. So, uh, uh, Louise, if I may, uh, what counts as illicit trade? The definition, a kind of a pure, understandable definition of illicit trade, and why should we be concerned about this problem? Illicit trade consists of both Ill clearly illegal trade like human trafficking, drug trafficking, arms trafficking, and also many forms of commerce that are not as easily identifiable. For example, counterfeit goods, which need to be identified as counterfeit to be seen as illicit. In antiquities, if you have an antiquity dug up before 1970, then it can be illegal, but if it's dug up after that, it can be illegal. And so you have illicit commodities, such as coins that can travel and be smuggled, and they can be a mixture of things that are both illegal and legal. And that brings us into this rather nebulous area of what is illicit trade. But the problem comes that illicit trade has expanded rapidly in the last 30 years into the cyber world. So things are being sold on the web and on the deep web, which is not searchable through um, search engines, and the dark web, which you need special tools to enter. And it's also expanded on social media. And with that, there's been in what I would call a catastrophic growth in illicit trade that is costing billions of dollars to individuals, to governments, and is undermining health and security of the planet. There is uh, something particular to Mexico, I think, and that is the theft of gasoline, the f illegal felling of trees, forests, uh, and of course the capture of species that are also sold in the black market. You would include all that, whether it's whether it crosses borders or not. It's all trade. Right. It doesn't have to be transnational crime. Uh, this is, there can be a domestic trade in, in these products. And what's interesting, and as my colleague Guadalupe Correa Cabrera has written, the Zetas have been very much involved in the energy sector as well as in the drug sector. And this is part of a general movement we're seeing internationally where criminal actors, corrupt actors, are moving into the world of environmental products. We've seen that with ISIS, that its main source of revenue was dealing in, sm in oil and smuggling it. And we see this involvement in illicit mineral trade, fish, trees, in many, many parts of the world. The monetization of everything and then its burial into the dark markets. But I call it more than the monetization of it, because we've always had organized crime functioning in time-sensitive industries. So they'd be involved in fish markets or in the ports, where if you don't move something, it loses its value. The fish rots, the bananas rot. And now we're living in a time-sensitive planet, where we have seven and a half billion people on the planet and not enough resources. Just here at um, 
the Baker Institute, we've been talking with a colleague where there's been co construction in Mexico City where there's not enough water. So water becomes a commodity for illicit trade in Central America and many other parts of Latin America and the world. So that's what we're looking at, is when these resources are scarce, they become more valuable and become commodities for illicit actors. Uh, do we have any idea if you include uh, the illicit trade within national boundaries and the transnational illicit trade, uh, how much this is worth? It's hard to know, but for example, the, the largest commodity of this is supposed to be counterfeit goods. Hard to know, but the estimate is a half a billion dollars a year just in counterfeit goods. So we're talking about um, um, a half a trillion dollars, $500 billion, oh. I should say, mm -hmm. in counterfeit goods. So we're talking in the trillions of dollars annually in illicit trade. And if you add illicit financial flows on top of it, we're looking at even more. So some people might estimate that it is as much as 10% or even more of the global economy. So if we're talking about a, a global economy that is worth about 60 to $65 trillion, as much as $6.5 trillion may be illicit trade. That's possible, and not an exaggeration, especially as it goes into cyberspace and financial resources, intellectual property are stolen, and there's just a massive trade in illicit and non-tangible goods. So, Luis, connect for me the relationship, surely a complicated one, between illicit trade and corruption. Unfortunately, it is a very close relationship. In fact, if you go into my index, the probably the largest number of entries that I documented applies to the word corruption. Because corruption is present along the entire supply chain by which you deliver goods. It's corruption, you have heads of state who are involved in illicit activity, such as Maduro in Venezuela, who has been involved in the drug trade. So you have corruption at the top of government, and you have corruption at the lower levels that facilitate it, and you have corrupt behavior by multinational corporations, many which have been fined for helping facilitate illicit trade in drugs, in proliferation, and many other very harmful activities. So corruption is absolutely key to this well-functioning and illegal trade. So corruption could be, I guess, described as the, the, the grease that maintains the coggery, that, that allows the coggery of illicit trade to function well and to connect all these different actors. It's both the grease and it's also the engine. Oh, I see. Because some people are doing this in part as heads of state to benefit themselves, but sometimes they're doing it also to benefit their state. So it is a much more central phenomenon to this activity but something that we generally ignore in the corruption literature. So tell me, uh, obviously, uh, illicit trade is not new. It's probably thousands of years old. Mm -hmm. It's always been there. But there is a new component today, uh, the acceleration of technology and the use of the internet, as you mentioned, and computers and connections between actors that would not have the opportunity to come together in the past, to say somebody in China, with somebody in the US, with somebody in Russia, with somebody in Brazil, and now they can come together on the internet. So what is the actual effect uh, of this new reality, the cyber reality, on the, the illicit trade? It's just like, putting this illicit trade on steroids, as I call it, in the book, because it's now anonymous. Therefore, you don't have to cultivate relationships. You don't have to move to engage with your trading partners. And in many cases, it is financed by cryptocurrencies that further anonymize the transactions. And 
when it's conducted on the web, it can be fast, and it helps move drugs from China to the US, to Europe, to Canada. It is something that is moving on a rapid pace, and that is something that we've never seen on, on such a scale and with such rapidity and in such volume. Are governments, institutions, laws, and of course the agencies that prosecute this way behind? Well, let's think about this. In, if we go back to thinking about the Westphalian state, we're talking about territory and states and armies and law enforcement agencies have responsibility for control. But if something is going on in the cyber world, this is both a stateless world and it's a world in which online platforms are controlled by corporations and not by states. And therefore, in this discussion, we need to be talking not just about state responsibility to stem this activity, but the involvement of the corporate world. And they have to be very important actors in combating this illicit trade. But unfortunately, there has been such a focus in the corporate world and the building of this new technology on enhancing growth and not on being responsible corporate citizens. It helped contribute to, to hacking, it helped contribute to the dissemination of false news, and the illicit trade is one other harmful element of this new environment. Can, can you add this other component, which I think is important not to leave out of this conversation, which is human trafficking. Obviously, humans, too, are becoming part, uh, not only the perpetrators, but also the object of this illicit trade. So it's very interesting. DARPA, which is the US agency, it's part of the Pentagon, that helped develop the internet, has spent the last few years focusing on human trafficking. It's not what you think that the Pentagon usually does, and it's not as a moral issue, but it's a bit that they helped create this Frankenstein that has facilitated human trafficking, and now they took some of the best computer minds in the country and decided to address this issue. And one of the things that they found in the two-year period that they were working uh, against human trafficking is that there were about 250 million dollars of ads for trafficking victims. When you think that these ads may cost five or ten dollars a piece, a maximum of 25, it's giving you an idea of the volume of business that is going on on, on, on platforms advertising sexual services. And apart from that, you've got victims being recruited through social media and services sold through social media and delivery of clients, delivery of victims' clients through social media. So this has been an enormous driver for the growth of human trafficking. So, Luis, in your book, you mentioned the case of Venezuela. And obviously, Venezuela is uh, chaotic. It's been in the media lately because uh, its economy has collapsed. Uh, uh, there's a flight of three million, estimated three million Venezuelans out of the country. Uh, well, what can I say about Venezuela? It's practically a country uh, imploding. Uh, and you do make a link between the condition that Venezuela is going through today and illicit trade. Can you unfold, can you unpack that for us a little bit? All right. So there are many <clears throat> relationships between Venezuela and illicit trade. As I said, uh, it starts at the top, where the presidential um, airline or um, uh, airplane has been used to transport drugs by members of Maduro's family. So you've got the top of the government involved in the drug trade. But you've also had relationships between the Colombian uh, drug organizations who have found um, refuge, places to operate out of Venezuela. You've got a trade in many uh, different types of illicit commodities. You've got money laundering. Um, 
through the Venezuelan government, you've got safe space for terrorist groups as well as criminal organizations to operate. And what happens is that in an environment in which there is such chaos, such criminalization, you have massive refugee flows. This has been seen in Syria, it's been seen in Africa, and it's being seen on a massive scale in Venezuela where citizens are just fleeing in order to survive. So is this unique to Venezuela, or do you, have you actually detected that this has been going on also, perhaps to a lesser scale, but also in the rest of Latin America? Venezuela is a, a particularly serious example. Yes, there are serious problems of high-level collusion in the drug trade, but nowhere in Latin America do you see a population driven from to such impoverishment from being one of, you know, decades ago, one of the most affluent countries in Latin America to the level of the degradation of public services and even mm -hmm. the absence of, of, of food for the citizens. So it is an economy that has, where its illicit elements and its corruption have, have helped fuel a, a disastrous situation. So, Luis, uh, we, uh, those of us who live in the developed world, the United States, Europe, and so on, uh, are not necessarily, our hands are not necessarily clean. We participate. We are consumers of these goods. We know that many uh, people from the global north uh, go south and use uh, children and women. And, uh, you participate in the sexual trade and uh, and consume drugs and so on. Uh, what is the role that we play in the developed world that tends to take a high moral ground in this respect and sort of look down on the countries where this is much more obvious? What is our role in both fueling this trade and also in solving it? There are a few things that the situation is even more complicated. Everything that you said is correct, but there's more. So the gold that's been illegally mined out of Colombia by, by the FARC, by exploited miners, winds up being smelted in Miami and in Florida. The money that's made from so much of the illicit activity is laundered into real estate in the United States. It's gone into banks that have happily accepted this money. We've had Mexican money flow into Citibank and not be scrutinized in the past. So there is a very important role, not only for developed countries to be consumers of these illicit goods, to help facilitate the um, exploitation of human beings, but they are enormous beneficiaries of the financial flows that are leaving Latin America, and other developing countries. We're usually concerned with globalization, and we tend to pay a lot of attention, obviously, to the reactions of nationalist movements in the United States or in the UK or in other countries against uh, globalization. But perhaps we're not paying enough attention to this other globalizing aspect of the world, which is the illicit trade, which is very important. So. Is the nation state the right container, the right unit of analysis to fight illicit trade, or is it simply overwhelmed by this kind of trade? It's not just overwhelmed, it's in, incapable of doing this. Because I say so much of this illicit trade is facilitated by corporate actors. And if the state doesn't um, regulate some of the corporate world and make them responsible for what they're selling, or the financial movements that they're facilitating, then this activity just blossoms. So first of all, we need to be think about this as not being an activity that's confined to the developing world or the developed world. We're all in this together, with different parts of the world in different elements of the supply chain for this illicit trade and the money flows that go with it. And I think we need to talk not just about governmental strategies, but whole of society strategies. Yesterday, and you were present here at this 
seminar that we had on corruption in Latin America, and we heard from the vibrant civil society in Mexico that tries to deal with, with the corruption problems. So we need civil society, we need journalism, we need government, we need corporations, we need researchers. All of this is part of what we need to address this problem. So we need to be made more aware of it. And then we need what I call a whole of society approach in which we all work together to help develop solutions. And that may be in part by citizens demanding more action by government, more responsibility by corporations, corporate officials realizing the costs of what they're doing to society. And therefore, it is not something with simple solutions, but it is something in which progress can be made if diverse communities work together in many ways. And I talk of how technology can be applied for good, how corporations that have been part of the problem have become part of the solution, and the important role that civil society plays in so many parts of the world, even in difficult environments, in helping to address these issues. One final question. So clearly, uh, there are gaps or gray areas where illicit trade flourishes best. Uh, and that has to do when there are there, or there is a lack of agreements, international law, treaties, protocols, and so on, and organizations, international organizations that can close those uh, gray areas. At a time when the United States is withdrawing from agreements, from free trade agreements, when the UK wants to leave Europe, uh, when there are, when, when they're not as popular, when these organizations and these protocols and these international treaties and so on are not as popular, there was a resistance to them, and many countries are actually trying to uh, undo them, then that's just going to open more spaces for this kind of trade to flourish. Uh, can we really fight it in, in a situation in which there is such deep suspicion of these kinds of mechanisms globally? What you didn't mention is how much corruption in these countries is, is key to this operation. And by citizens and others demanding greater integrity, you're not necessarily depending, though there is much that could be done maybe through an international court against corruption, but there is much that can be done to help create conditions for a better environment with more transparency that are not entirely dependent on multinational bodies. But part of it requires greater cooperation and a much greater citizen awareness of the population of how these issues of not only drugs, but illicit timber trade, illicit fish, problems of water, undermine sustainability of life and the future for our children and our grandchildren. And with that, there may be a much greater motivation to deal with these problems that people don't understand have such immediacy for them. Well, thank you very much, Luis. It's been a pleasure to have you here at the Baker Institute. And thank you very much for sharing a few minutes of your time with us. And uh, certainly, this book, Dark Commerce, is a great contribution to our conversation. Thank you. It's been my pleasure to be here with you.